Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome everybody here present in the room. Uh, welcome everybody joining us online. Welcome to the Royal Netherlands Institute in Rome. My name is Susanna de Beer. I'm Director of Ancient Studies and Classical Receptions here at the Institute. Welcome to the third CNIR Research Dialogue of this academic year. This year's series, and actually also last year's, is dedicated to one of the core themes of current research at the Institute throughout the domains and time periods we study here from antiquity, archeology, span history, uh, and art history as well. And this is dedicated to very broadly defined colonization, colonialism, imperialism, or what we may term the more problematic or contested elements of Rome's widespread legacy. And we've actually just recently started up a research project, a research group in co collaboration with the University of Groningen entitled The Classical Roots of Early Modern and Modern Colonization to study exactly this dynamic. And just this week, and this is not a coincidence, the core team is present here at the CNIR to discuss the conceptual foundations of this research project. And we have Dina Wouters here, Jeremia Pelgrom, Arthur Westein, and from our staff, Tessa Steck, Maria Urban, and myself. And we will uh, uh, broaden this in the coming years. In this year's research dialogues, we have had contributions as diverse as taking it like candy, medicinal chocolate and the Society of Jesus, as well as contributions on museums as archives. And a little closer to today's topic, which connects classical reception studies to the knowledge and image of, in and about Africa. Last year, we've heard contributions by Barbara Goff on post-colonial classics in Africa and Elena Giusti's uh, Africa Shifting Landscapes, Rome, Rome's Imagined Geographies of Empire. But today, and we are very pleased and honored that we have found Carlo Taviani prepared to present his research to us. Carlo earned his bachelor's degree from the University La Sapienza in Rome and received his PhD from the University of Perugia. And he has taught at the University of Cape Town, University of Bologna, and now he is at the Università degli Studi di Teramo. He's also been research fellow at numerous institutes, really too many to mention. I just mentioned uh, the Itati, Harvard Center for Italian Renaissance Studies, and the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, but of course, the most prestigious one is his current fellowship at the Royal Netherlands Institute in Rome. His main research project here is entitled Genoese Merchant Networks in Africa and Across the Atlantic Ocean, 1450-1530. And this research is centered on the involvement of Italian traders in the early transatlantic slave trade and on how they used, changed, and transplanted economic and trading institutions. And he also recently, 2022, uh, published a book with Routledge, The Making of the Business Co Corporation, the Casa di San Giorgio and its Legacy. But today, Carlo Taviani will speak about Renaissance confusion on Africa. And we're looking for forward very much to his ideas. And of course, we hope he will not leave us confused at the end of the lecture. But before giving him the floor, just a reminder that this lecture series is not called a dialogue without a reason, meaning that after the presentation, after the lecture of maybe about an hour, three quarters of an hour, there will also be plenty of time for questions, discussions, and sharing ideas here in the room, but also with the people at home. So the floor is yours. So thank you, Susanna, for this very generous introduction. And I wish to thank the Institute, all the colleagues and the director for the invitation to be here this year as a fellow. And I have to say that it's very stimulating uh, environment for me. So I, I'm, I'm back after some years uh, that I've worked in several places and I'm back in Rome, that is where I grew up. And it's, I have to say that it's really interesting and being here back, but in, in Rome, but also in a new environment. And so that, for that, my gratitude. So this is a, a new project um, and are a sort of uh, uh, topics, a series of topics on which I want to, to reflect. 
and it's parallel to my main project, as Susanna mentioned, uh, which is more on economic history. This is more, of, uh, I would say, about culture, but it's in connection of, of the other project. And I, I, I wanted to, to give this lecture because I want to reflect on, this, on these topics on which I started to think um, some years ago. And in the course of the years, always they came out, and so I decided to, uh, to present this lecture today. During the Renaissance um, in Europe, uh, the, represent, uh, the appearance of classical Greek and Roman forms was the result of common and widespread practices of scholarship in various fields. Here in Rome, painters such as Raphael walked along Roman ruins overgrown with vegetation or entered what they thought were grottos, but were in fact the remains of an ancient Roman villa in search of ancient models such as bas reliefs statues and frescoes. Uh, Raphael and others initiate, imitated these ancient works of art and created new forms. As that one you can see here with these ancient uh, bas reliefs uh, from which Raphael has taken this image. Sometimes statues charged with an unknown kind of intense classical pathos would literally rise from the ground as happened with the Lacon group which is here, which emerged here in, in Rome and is at the Vatican Museums. In the last century, a number of scholars have delved deeply into this subject and developed a methodology to study the resurgence of classic antiquity during the Renaissance in the Italian peninsula. Among them, I would like to mention Abi Warburg, who dedicated his life to creating an entire library on the subject. And you can see here the library as it was. Then he moved uh, the library from Hamburg to London because of the Nazi persecution and created a research institute. And you see here uh, the project uh, is one of his projects, but one of the most important called the Mnemosine Atlas, a sequences of forms of pathos through several ages. At the same time, that artists and scholars were rediscovering the past in Rome between the 15th and 16th centuries, there were intense connections with the African continent and the Atlantic. Connections with North Africa and the northern shores of the Mediterranean never really achieved during the centuries between classic antiquity and what we call the Middle Age. Muslim Islamic merchants were in contact with Christian traders Although rules and norms prohibited this kind of cross-cultural trade. But then in the period when uh, the, Renaissance, the Renaissance was at its height, the King of Portugal promoted a series of voyages to the west coast of Africa. And they began roughly in the 1440s. And you can see here a series of the, um, the hotspots on the coast of Morocco, and then even if those are small points, uh, you have to think that the archipelagos were very important because some of the process that we are studying as colonization indeed started from the islands. But islands were not, I mean, only a few times islands are alone. Always are archipelagos, so groups of islands. And you can see here Madeira, then there are the Canary Islands, um, then Cape Verde here, Sao Tome Principe here. So Portuguese moved in these archipelagos and then also people from uh, other uh, areas of the Iberian Peninsula. And the Portuguese uh, set up this, uh, this trade post, especially in West Africa. And then of course, circumnavigated Africa on the Cape of Good Hope and went to Asia towards India to Calcutta at the end of 15th century. No written sources have been found in West Africa previous of the arrival of the Portuguese. There are archeological remains and we will see some of them later. But so far, scholars have tended to rely on written European sources. The problem is that some of these sources are biased because they tend to create or recreate topoi about these areas and the people of West Africa. Stereotype, basically. I want to give you an idea of the layers of information we can read through the sources 
the written sources, some are European sources. In 1447, a Genoese merchant, Antonio Malfante, went to what is now southern Algeria in the kingdom, kingdom of Tlemcen, in the area of Tuat, not far from Sigil Massa. Sigil Massa actually nowadays in Morocco. And so basically in this area, let me, so here, and you, you can see this complex network of roads in the Sahara. So here, he went here. He entered, uh, he, he wanted to look for Sudanese gold, which was very important for the Genoese traders. He entered in contact with people who lived between that area and Timbuktu in Mali. Actually, the source from Alfante, you see here from a manuscript we recently, with, a group, with the other project we have found in Genoa, and this first mention in Christian Europe of Timbuktu in Mali. So uh, he entered in contact with this uh, stretched network of traders because in the Sahara trade networks tended to stretch far away. They were like a family who deal with a region that was uh, big and wide as the Iberian Peninsula only. Malfante provided in the letter a series of information on Islamic traders who, who protected him, on Jewish traders who he defined as very trustworthy, and then on sub-Saharan traders. When Malfante came to this last point, the sub-Saharan traders, it is clear that his information is biased by long-standing and I would say proto-racist topoi and by the enormous distance that separated his sources from this supposed reality, this group of people. We can really see this in the letter, that is this, uh, the letter which survived and has been studied. We, we see that the distance create a space of ignorance and made feel its outer very uncertain. So we can perceive how the outer was uncertain about the faraway places. And the reason he wanted to explore this area was because of gold, which came from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa, mainly up until this period and later on, the majority of gold in Europe, uh, uh, for, I mean, roughly but until the end of 15th century. So the aim of my paper is to show the complicated puzzle of interwind pieces of information about Africa during the Renaissance in Mediterranean Europe. I will talk mainly about sources from the Italian and sometimes from the Iberian peninsulas, but geographically, we have to imagine the area of diffusion in several other places of Mediterranean Europe. Why do I say that there was a complicated puzzle of information? My hypothesis is not uh, is that not only because Europeans received information about distant lands, and we know that distance can distort information, information as I've mentioned. The other reason is that the, this mix, this conundrum, or if you prefer the, the confusion, came from new news reaching Europe with new voyages and encounters, and from the other hand, ancient information. In classical antiquity, contacts between the Italian peninsula and in general, the northern shores of the Mediterranean and the African continent were more extensive than in the following periods of the so-called Middle Age. Romans were present in North Africa, and you can see here a mosaics from Morocco, with several African animals. And from there, they traded with several people of the continent, of the African continent. The Greek antiquity also shows in the remains a widespread kind of contacts, as you can see here from these uh, Greek pieces here that represent people of Sub-Saharan Africa in these two objects. This is why some information about Africa has resurfaced resurfaced, just as philologists or artists like Raphael have rediscovered past antiquity during the Renaissance. On the other hand, we have this new, newly discovered information from classical antiquity, and on the other hand, new voyages and encounters. Now, 
this is why, um, so I would like to show this confusion and see how it was generated and what kind of research we can develop from this set of information on some regions of the, on, of the African continent. And obviously Africa is huge, was and is huge, so I will focus only on certain regions. Because for instance, if we focus on Ethiopia, there were different kind of contacts, but we will focus on West Africa and Atlantic. That is roughly the story that we have to deal with. And I want to focus on three uh, subjects, three topics, legends and tropes or account about trade, then the actual trade in animals. And then I will uh, close with a, a small focus on slavery, enslavement. The reason why I'm presenting these three topics is because I hope that they help me to reflect on a methodology that we can develop to study this confusion of this mix of information. So let's go back for a moment to Abi Warburg, the library of Abi, Abi Warburg, where we were a few minutes ago, because I want to bring you to some of the shelves of the library. So this is the new library nowadays. So this is the part on trade, economic contacts, let's say. Those are some of the pieces that were stick, that were put on the books. Some of them were old at the time of when uh, Warburg was alive. And this is one of the shelves on trade. And you can, you can see that we can find here we were in the 19th century and the 20th century books which have this racist uh, label like primitive trade. I mean, some of these is not about prehistory. It's about early modern trade. As you can see here, primitive Polynesian economy. But then you have Middle Age and Renaissance. So you have this opposition here. Then there is one of these book, actually this one, which is the Stummer Handel. Actually, the, the title of this uh, article is this small book, is Stummer Handel und Filanzage. And this is the author, which dedicated here the, the small book to Barbour here, dedication. So, what was the Stummer Handel? I, I mean, I can translate the Stummer Handel in. Uh, from German as silent trade. And I will come back to this very book. So let's, let's explain a moment what the silent trade was or what we think is. And as with this topic, I want to, I mean, I want to use this topic as a case study to look at this confusion and this, this mixed uh, um, kind of knowledge during the Renaissance. Um, I'm doing this, uh, I started some years ago with a colleague, an, an archaeologist, Gerard Schwen, who is based in the States, is an expert of um, a, a, a town a, a city in Nigeria, uh, Ileife. I will, I will talk a moment about it uh, in a few minutes. And we started this conversation. It's really a dialogue. We wanted to publish something together, but we have different ideas. So we decided either we publish like a dialogue on, on, a, on an article or we continue to do research. And that's what we are doing so far. So what's the silent trade? You can either read or listen to me, it's the same. So the idea was, and that we have sources, I will show you about that, that there were two parties, two group of people that had to trade, but they never meet in person, they never talk. So one group, let's call that group A, went in a place and left some goods, let's say clothes, and then went away making noise with drum or other uh, uh, instrument to make noise, to, to music or noise, to signal that they were leaving the place. Then the second group, the group B, arrived and put the other goods, let's say gold. And then they make noise and, and went away. Then the, the first group came back and decided whether the, the gold was enough. Otherwise, they adjusted their quantity of goods. They didn't touch the gold. They touched only the clothes. So they reduced it or increased the clothes. Or if they liked the gold, they took the gold and went away. If they didn't like, they just adjusted their amount of goods, the clothes made noise and went away. Then the other group came back. And if they liked, 
the clothes, they took the clothes, went away, and then the other group come back and took the gold. So ne they never met, but they had exchange, exchanged goods. So what's the story? Are historians, uh, only Max Foster, they're speaking about the Stummerhandel, who wrote about that? Where did this story come from? Where does this story come from? So what I did, I collected what we are doing, we are collecting all the sources that are known about the silent trade. You have to imagine that so far we have collected like a bibliography of 40 titles, so it's a very specific topic with a lot of production of, of papers, articles, and books since I would say the uh, 19th century, but we have sources or pretended to be sources for the previous centuries. And let's start from the first one, Herodotus. So we have classic sources and then several others. And I want to focus, just follow me on this, on this series of sources. So the first reference is by Herodotus, and we found here many characteristics of, about the silent trades of the following centuries. Herodotus described the Phoenician who traded in Libya, which was the name, as the people at that time called various places in Africa, West Africa, the Western shores, or North Africa. And Herodotus characterized one party, the people from Libya, from Africa, involved in the silent trade as less interested than the other party, the Phoenicians, in making profit. The people from Libya were more interested, interested in exchanging gifts to satisfy the foreigners. Then Philostratus in the Vitae Apollonio uh, speaks about, spoke about Ethiopians and Egyptians at the boundaries. Here, the author used the harmony which characterized the silent trade to criticize the attitude of the Greeks, who were only interested in trading and making profit. And then we have other sources. We have the Arabic Islamic sources. So when I say that there is, there is this confusion in the Italian peninsula and during the Renaissance, I, I want to complicate the picture here. So let's think of what I've said in the previous minutes about uh, information came from the late antiquity and new informations from encounters. Actually, there was also Arabic, uh, Islamic information and knowledge which arrived during the so-called Middle Age. That's to complicate, uh, let's say, the picture. And, and in the case of the silent trade, these information were related of this exchange of very important commodities, salt, which was very important in the Sahara, for instance, and copper. When, when Antonio Malfante, the guy we have uh, spoke about him a few minutes ago, he went there in 4047, people asked about copper. And I will show you there are some copper amazing um, artworks which were created in Nigeria at that time. And then we have other sources. We have Renaissance sources. Frau Mauro would uh, draw a map, an incredible map. There is a, a project online. You can go and looking for Frau Mauro's map, very detailed with images and a lot of information written. And then Alvise de Cadamosto was a Venetian who went in West Africa in 1455. Actually, it's the first trip of a European and, and not the first trip, but the first account, detailed account about West Africa, that of Cadamosto. And that of the Fra Mauro, the information on the Fra Mauro and connected the silent trade uh, actually is new information discovered by Chet Van Duzer, an, an historian of cartography very recently. Then we have later sources of other person who wrote, you, you can see here, John Guy, but then the silent trade became something which is connected also to other lands. You see here, Mexico and other places. So what I want to do now is also to focus a little bit on historiography about the silent trade, because you can see that really historiography and sources at a certain point are mixed. Of course, when we pick up, when we focus on Herodotus, that we consider that a source. But what, when we arrive at, at the 18th, 19th century, we have a source, but at the same time, we have what we call historiography, which is creating and, and forming. So with this, it, it's a small topic, but there are a lot of sources and 
uh, reference, historiographical reference. So I just want to mention the field of uh, studies that have uh, focused on this topic. So new institutional economists, anthropologists, archaeologists, experts of uh, Africa, uh, scholars of classic studies. Maybe the field mostly related to the silent trade is that one of economic anthropology. And so it covers a, a wide period from Herodotus to the 20th century. I'm not saying that Herodotus was an economic anthropologist, by the way, but, but it's, it's interesting that later on it becomes that the field. So usually the silent trade has been considered as a subject studied by scholar of the second half of the 20th century and thus by the English speaking academic community. However, even a brief analysis of the older historiography reveals that well before it was studied as the Stummer Handel by German scholars, particular, uh, particularly interested in the Stummer Handel or the Sprachlos Handel, the trade without words, was the intellectual group of the Historische Rechtsschule, the German school of the history of law at the end of the 19th century. There were people like Karl Lehmann, Gustav Schumoller, maybe these names uh, don't say much to you, but they were actually the people to, uh, with whom uh, studied Max Weber. And so they, they described um, the silent trade, the Stummer Handel, as a mixture of trust and mistrust. And then there are a few works by German anthropologists, such as the Stummer Handel und Filanzage by Max Foster that I've shown uh, to you, uh, dedicated to Abi Warburg. And the, the hypothesis of this scholar was, the, the idea was that even when two populations were at war, they exchanged metals and other uh, fundamental commodities. And that was why they developed the silent trade, because they were at war in case of conflict. Then the works of the German Historische Rechtsschule were used by another field of studies, the new institutional economics, that is a, a field of economists that has been developed in the past years. Don't say much, but there are uh, some very important scholars, also scholars who decide you know, about money in our, in our time, in our countries. So one of uh, the, the most interesting studies is that of by Karl Polanyi. And, and we have here some of the others. And then here, you have here that one of Karl Polanyi here. So the idea by Karl Polanyi was that basically uh, argued that trade was, as we know, in the recent time, only from the 19th century. And then within the previous century, centuries, reciprocity and re redistribution were the main transnational models. So the idea is you see from Herodotus to these scholars is that there is this tension between exchanging gift from one hand or the trade economy to the others. But you don't find only in Karl Polanyi, you, you find even in Herodotus when he says that the, the people in Africa were more interested in this gift economy exchange. And then to complicate the picture, there is this guy, uh, a very interesting scholar, Paolo de Moraes Farias, who wrote an article, I mean, after all the others we have seen, saying the silent trade never existed. It was only a legend, a myth. Moraes Farias has been traded as, as a doctor and then became an expert of West Africa. So he, he translated the... Uh, uh, a lot of stones which were carved in Mali of the 14th century is really an expert of West Africa. So he said it's a kind of cultural proxy which could help the trade in Africa. As a conclusion of the, this brief analysis of the literature and sources, I would like to point out that the studies on the silent trade somehow mirror the tension which exists in various disciplines, such as economic history, institutional studies, anthropology, between modern economy and gift exchange, as I said. But let's see what we can say, if we can say a little bit more 
I'm kind of skeptical. Uh, let's say I'm agnostic about this topic. I don't know what to think. To me, it could be that was it existed or it did not. Let's see also the reason why, what could have been. So we are speaking about this area of West Africa and the Sahel and the Sahara here with these complex connections actually are very difficult to study because to think those are in the Sahara. So they change all the time. It's not like having a street, then the sand arrive. So that's what, what scholars have figured out looking at uh, temperature and weather across several centuries. And here, as I was saying, in this area, nowadays Nigeria, there were these places where uh, a very interesting culture developed over here, especially in Ilevi, Ife, nowadays Ife. Uh, is, a, is a region, is a, uh, a, a city of Nigeria where the Yoruba people are. And then there was the Igbo Uku culture. So there are remainings, these are uh, excavations that have been done. And then those are the remainings of the Igbo Uku. This area, very old masterpiece, like this one. And then these are the famous head of Ileife. And it's a culture which developed between the 12th and late 14th century. And I mean, I'm not an expert of archaeology, I'm not neither of art history, I'm not an expert of many things. And but um, what I see, only because I've, I mean, I lived many years in Florence, that is, this is more realistic even than that Renaissance art, as a if realism is a category, I don't know if it is. But but look how realistic it is. And in this area, they also produced glass, glass beads. So after, in the following centuries, glass beads arrived from Venice. And uh, actually, glass beads has been found recently even in Alaska, Venetian glass beads. But the, those were produced in uh, 13th and 14th century Nigeria, in this area. So what we have? We have... Europeans uh, creating uh, some trade post on the coast of Africa. They didn't know anything when they arrived, the Europeans in 15th century about the interland of Africa. Here is one of the hypotheses that, I don't know if I can say we, uh, with, with my colleague are making, but it's, it's a possibility, let's say. So the idea is that there were communities, we have cert certain uh, evidences, of course, of that. And that trade, which happened within the community, was quite simple, while this area was a friction between different communities. So here is like a representation of one community. You can have normal trade within. And then when you arrive to the boundaries, could be tension and conflicts. So where you see the exchange of important commodities, such as copper or gold or enslaved people is between these areas, between these boundaries here. So one of the hypotheses is this, that the silent trade is the exchange which existed between these areas of friction, which was not trade, was more similar to kind of a prestige goods economy. And you can see here that, again, under hypothesis, we are doing that when the silent trade existed, if it existed, and when it disappeared, because the, when the European arrived, this is the commodification of the economy, economics, so the new way to make exchange, more connected to coins, to other values, and then it disappeared. And in fact, it disappears from the sources. So this is, uh, this scheme, this and, and this, it is if the silent trade was a real institution. So was it an historical practice or a myth? We do not know, at least I don't know, but my idea is that if we collect all sources and make comparison between sources, we can differentiate them like tracking I don't know, like doing a philological map, like philologists do. And that can help us at least 
to study this confusion between information that came up as new sources because of the encounter, let's think to Cadamosto, that went in West Africa, which has information on the silent trade, and information came as a rediscovery from classic antiquity. So at least with the silent trade, we have two problems. One, that I'm using the silent trade for my case study on Renaissance confusion. And the other one, but it existed or not, that's the question. But for my purpose today, it's not important if it existed or not. It is important that I use as a case study to see the conundrum of information. That's why, because I'm agnostic, because it's more convenient also. So now I want to switch to uh, um, another topic, which is also connected to this mix and information, a little bit easier. And it's about uh, animals which arrive from the uh, African continent and trade in animals. I'm skipping this slide and moving to this one, the animals. Animals from the African continent were more present in Roman time in the northern shores of the Mediterranean and with the new contacts Europe reactivated during the Renaissance, their presence spread again. Some of them were likely present, such as lions. Let's think, for instance, to the so-called lion of Berbery, which was a huge lion. And then now it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but let's think about the uh, lion of Berbery, North Africa, which lived in the Atlas Mountains of North Africa. Some others, such as elephants, giraffe, rhinoceros, and certain kind of non-human primates, disappeared during the Middle Age from Europe. This is why the elephant of Leo X, Anno, this one, acquired such a huge fame during the early 16th century. Artists such as Raphael and then Dürer sketched famous drawings of this animal. Actually, here there is the famous drawing by Dürer about a rhinoceros. Actually, the rhino, you might have noticed here, is not an African rhino because he has only one horn and the African rhino has two horns. Um, this one has one. So this rhino of uh, early 16th century, 1515, arrived from India and was and arrived to Lisbon, Portugal, and then had to fight against Hanno, this elephant. I'm showing these uh, paintings and I'm diverting partially from Africa looking at this animal because I want to give you an idea on how it's possible to grasp information on these topics looking at uh, sources in the archives, which I hope can help us to differentiate between the sources, this confusion of Renaissance sources. So uh, several uh, voyages of Portuguese stepped in the Cape of Good Hope in West Africa from India, and then they arrived in Europe. So this was an Indian rhino, which passed from the African continent. The rhino arrived in the early 16th century, had to fight with an elephant. He won the fight in Lisbon. And then they decided the king of Portugal wanted to uh, make a gift. Trade, silent trade, I mean, it's, that's to say that gift exchange existed also in Europe, not only in Africa. So he wanted to send his gift to the Pope Leo X. But then, unfortunately, uh, the, the, there was a shipwreck and the Reno died. The body of the Reno arrived on the shores of Liguria, but a drawing, a small sketch of the Reno, that was called also Ganda uh, from uh, Indian languages, uh, arrived to Dürer. And so Dürer created this iconic image using this drawing. What has happened that with this, my other project on the Genoese networks, which is more maybe boring and about a lot of, we are studying with a group of scholars, a lot of notarial deeds in the archives, one deed after the other, we discovered recently that some of the information that other um, people, not just like Dürer, but for instance, Paolo Giovio, the famous historian, who was a, a physician and an historian, wrote about the Reno that was like, was like a monster that he could, was able to fight the elephant. Actually, this information pre-existed because in the notarial archive of Genoa, we have found information 
from the traders who were trading with the African continent, who, uh, they were the brokers of insurance of that ship where the Reno was. And actually these uh, merchants and traders, they said that the Reno was a monster and that was, could fight against the elephant. So actually you can see from this information that when there are uh, these stories about, in this case, about animals arriving and becoming iconic images, like a drawing and also in the writings of Paolo Giovio, there is a pre-knowledge that existed and spread mouth to mouth. And it's possible to find actually in the archive. But now I want to focus on, on animals which can be uh, mostly connected to my idea of this Renaissance confusion, apes or non-human primates. We have to keep in mind that certain non-human primates were known to Europe only very lately. Gorillas, for instance, only in the 19th century. However, in Cartago, it is said that in the Roman times there were skins of gorillas. Therefore, the Renaissance represents an important moment to think about the knowledge in Europe existed about these animals. Let's look at this picture. This represents an ape and a satyr from a 12th century bestiary a specific kind of books on animals. And the second one is again a book of animals, but of the 15th century, a book by Pierre Candido de Cembio, which is kept here in the Vatican Library in Rome. And as you can see, here there is a difference because the ape has acquired a more zoological form, at least in the head here, if we compare with this other one. Actually, this is not even called an ape, it's called an homo silvestri in the best theory. While here in 15th century, we see, I'm not speaking about the body, but about the head, more zoological uh, characteristics. And the satyr is more clearly a mythological creature in this picture here, if we compare with this one. So, in the, in the passage between from one picture to the other, we see that some knowledge has been acquired. So what I think is that because of that, this is an hypothesis I'm working on, but because of this more uh, spread and contacts that existed between the um, Europe, European continent and Africa, there was more knowledge about monkeys, uh, non-human primates, and so step by step, you can see the differentiation of this process. There, there is also, but I didn't put here, an image later on of the 17th century where you can clearly see, see the non-human primate. So you see that the knowledge accumulated and helped to differentiate between creature. I want to also to mention something which is a little bit more conceptual that the satyr is accompanying the ape to me because they together represent a mirror of the human form. That happened, uh, it's only an hypothesis at the moment, because the boundaries between human and non-human might have been put into question after encounter with apes and non-human primates, which existed in the 15th century. We, we have uh, Kate Law recently, in, uh, a few years ago, has pointed out that, for instance, at a certain point, some Portuguese traders um, had uh, found a pygmy people and put in a cage. So the document is unclear, but th the hypothesis that is possible to make that uh, she did actually that was that it maybe they didn't know whether they consider these people or not using a cage. So we can see that when uh, focusing on, on non-human apes is also a way to reflect on, on stereotypes, on racist stereotypes and contacts between population of the European continent and an African continent. So it's a very important topic. And I think that we have to be aware that a lot of sources are biased and to uh, that's why also I'm working on the silent trade in that way that, I, that we have to look at the tradition of the studies, which is behind also. And I want now, and I will uh, finish with this final point, to focus on a third topic, 
which is, which is enslavement and captives. And to do that, since this is a huge topic, I want to start from a, um, a very small focus, let's say. And I will speak about triumph. In ancient Rome, the essence of a triumph was a victorious general leading a military procession through the streets of Rome, accompanied by his troops and the spoils of war, including captives. The Romans celebrated generals and emperors through arches such as those of Titus. Here you can see a detail from the arch of Titus. And here you can see here, this is here in Rome, the Arch of Titus. Triumph had a complex tradition and were most likely a relic of Etruscan culture. And I don't want, I don't want to pretend because another area where I'm ignorant is classic antiquity. So I don't want to enter too much this area. However, what I want to do is to emphasize the way they were reused and imitated centuries later during the Renaissance especially as a way to create a relationship of empowerment and control over people. Kings, princes, despots during the Renaissance reused the tradition of triumphs to enter cities, often creating an ephemeral apparatus that is making triumphal arches that were later celebrated by painters and artists in general. As you can see here in this series of images by several authors depicting triumphs or triumphal entries. And you see here, those are mainly from the 15th, early 16th century, because this is the mainly the tradition of triumphs uh, during the Renaissance. Triumphs of Caesar by Jacopo Palma il Vecchio, early 16th century. Biagio d'Antonio in workshop, the triumph of Camillus at the end of 15th century. I'm jumping here and there between 15th and 16th centuries. Or this is actually the image is not of good quality. This is, is a cassone. So there was this box of wood that were put in the uh, in in the bedrooms, and it depicts uh, probably from the Angari master the triumph of Scipio Africanus again, the, at the end of 15th century. Then later on, you can find also in the 16th and 17th century, you can see there were a lot of African animals usually in triumphs, and this is by Durer which represent the triumphs of uh, Kaiser Maximilian. And it's a complex series of engravings, uh, many, many all together, very kind of complex. And this is one of later print, which depict people of the new world in within a triumph. So rulers use the triumphal entries into conquered cities to reaffirm their power uh, over local elites as seen several times in the 15th, 16th centuries. The ancient Roman tradition of triumphs was thus reused as a new way to reaffirm their power. And now I want to show you, maybe this is the most famous series of triumphs in the Renaissance, those by Mantegna at the end of 15th centuries. Those are a series of panels I didn't put together as they are in reality, so, uh, but because I want to, to to show you some details. And you can see here, there are the booty. So the arms of the enemies were put together. So here, some scholars have argued that certain pictures such as those, and I will come to this, such as those of captives here, you can see the captives here, or those of the people who are make music with these instruments. So some scholars have argued that those pictures are reflecting the Greek sources and not the Roman tradition of triumphs. Particularly, they are reflecting Plutarch's notion of triumphs as a spectacle of military terror. So according to some art historian, if you see also the face of these captives here, and also some says that the way that these uh, instruments were reused is the way they use it during battles. So here is not the triumph where is celebrating the entrance of someone who is even reaffirming his power in a city, but the terror of the triumphs. And 
there is this shift using Greek sources instead of uh, Roman sources. Not many Renaissance triumphs or triumphal entries involved the forced participation of enslaved Africans during the Renaissance. And as I've shown, the majority of images typically portrayed Europeans. My argument is that the reactivation of such a tradition during the Renaissance, which often depicted people as booty and objectification, and I'm thinking of, again at my, uh, the sources of Mantegna and Plutarch and the terror, I think that it's possible that this tradition further entrenched practices of captivity. This occurred at the time when Europeans in their encounters with new populations, such as those from the African continent or the new world, were in, in the process of developing new methods of dispossession and enslavement. And again, I know that the majority of people are depicted in triumph are people from Europe, but look at what, I mean, the people from the new world are depicted in a triumph as a booty. As a historian, I have to say that it is one thing for me to work on relics or work of art, such as paintings, bas reliefs, and so on. It is quite another hand to, to try to study the actual practices of triumphs. Did they exist? We have much less evidence, but we do have some. For instance, in 1326, the despot of Lucca, Castruccio Castragani, to whom Machiavelli dedicated one of his works, defeated the Florentine forces and made a triumphal entry into Lucca. The defeated prisoners were forced to carry candles in honor of San Martin, the patron of Lucca. We do not have painting, but we have sources. And according to scholars who have studied this entry, this was done reactivating the idea of ancient triumph. So of course we can find during the Middle Age entries where there were prisoners without, they connected to the tradition of triumphs. I'm not making the argument that all the uh, forced entries or the captives that were brought into uh, with other people were have to be triumph. But what I'm saying is that if you are reactivating a tradition aesthetically with works of art, then there are there is also the possibility, at least we have to take into account, that this tradition also reactivate practice of violence. With this last point on triumph, I wanted to introduce a broader issue. We know that slavery existed far back in the past, actually it ever existed, existed in medieval Europe and then in the Renaissance Europe and many other places. However, ancient practices of enslavement enslavement may have been reactivated during the Renaissance. The extent to which classical antiquity had an influence on slavery in the 15th century and later, the period of we call the Renaissance, has yet to be determined, I think. So we have uh, works on uh, how people, for instance, from the African continent, West Africa, were depicted during the Renaissance. But what I'm saying here that as far as I know, and this, is, this might be a huge topic, but there are not many studies on, on the fact that, okay, we had studied for more than a century the Renaissance as the, the discovery of the classic antiquity. Why we don't take into account the possibility that not just forms of art were reactivated, but also form of violence. And so maybe sometimes, and I don't know if the argument was clear, but we triumph. I'm saying, okay, the, the painters are using these images, but within static, then also violence can enter as a process and can be absorbed. I now want to come to a brief conclusion on the whole paper. If we look at several issues related to Renaissance knowledge of Africa, we can see that there are several types of sources old sources that have been rediscovered and now and new sources that mention encounters. This puzzle of information can be studied so that we can have a better understanding of what comes from a distant past and what comes from more recent encounters. Sometimes, as in the case of the silent trade, it seems that it is not all about information, the information 
newly rediscovered or from the ancient past or the new one from encounters. If we read Alvise da Cadamosto's account of 15th century West Africa, we see that he refers to the silent trade in a way that seems to mimic ancient sources. What I'm saying is that people who travel far from Europe towards, in this case, towards Africa, already had in mind some models derived from ancient times. These ancient forms of knowledge function as the very same patterns in which new information was cataloged and recorded. So there is not just a problem of having new information from travels, journeys, and past antiquity, but the fact that I have a scheme in mind on which I attach the information that I take from new evidence and sources. I hope that studying this process of continuing reframing of knowledge can help us focus on, complicate, on complex historical dynamics of exploitation and enslavement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. You can, yeah, you can uh, uh, stay here. Thank you very much for this not at all confusing uh, lecture in which you actually made very clear how different sort of strands of knowledge came together and were sometimes mixed, but even today, not always easy to to disentangle. It's not easy to to decide what uh, what is the truth. I think it's very uh, well actually also uh, reflecting on our discussions today. One. One of the points you ended with is, I think, very important, the question to what extent this classical tradition or reactivating the classics is not just sort of legitimizing practices, but also re really sort of reactivating practices, not only aesthetic, but also indeed violent practices, or uh, we were talking about uh, also really sort of informing uh, colonizing uh, practices. So it's really um, yeah, very much tied up with these broader discussions. Um, I'm very uh, sure that there are questions and remarks uh, from the audience here, also from uh, the people at home, uh, who I invite to uh, either post questions in the chat, but you can also just uh, start uh, talking or raising a hand. Usually this works uh, quite well. So uh, who can I give the floor? Uh, yes, Artyar. Thank you. Um, thanks, Carlo, for this very wide-ranging talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, going back to the, the final point on triumphs, I was thinking about uh, the triumph of Charles V after conquering Tunis, uh, which is probably the, the sort of most grandiose example of a Renaissance triumph in, in a classical manner. Um, and I was wondering, um, if I'm not mistaken, part of the triumph is not only about the triumph the, the reconquest of Tunis, but it's also about the, the liberation of Christian slaves uh, from Ottoman um, captivity. And in that context, I was wondering, maybe just to make your story even more complex, whether uh, as part of this, the, the, the phenomena that you described, there's also a tension, not just a sort of the tension perhaps between, between Europe and Africa, but also the tension between Christianity and Islam involved in all these uh, um, well, the different phenomena that you have been uh, uh, discussing is that is that part of 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 the the discussion according to you, or should it be considered something something different? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very confusing question, perhaps, but just to increase the confusion even more. Thank you so much. It has to be confused. <laughs> so yeah, as I've mentioned with the silent trade, so. I tried, I don't know if I meant it, but I tried to give an impression of clarity saying there are information from past antiquity and new uh, information from actual contact of the time, but there is uh, the, left, the elephant in the room. I mean, it's uh, this, this big important topic that, for instance, came out from uh, my analysis, I think, of the silent trade that are Arabic Islamic sources. And so is for triumph, with the triumph you have mentioned, Charles V, that uh, has to be considered part because the Europeans uh, saw people like it was the case in Tunis as the others, but also because the Arabic culture medi mediated the classic culture. So uh, we have that, that addition 
I mean, to, to complicate the picture. So of course, I wanted to, yeah, to show how that already the fact that we don't know whether some information came from new contact or from the past is, is, a, is confusing our, our ideas. If I focus on the silent trade and think about Carpolani, I cannot refrain to see that is basically mimicking Herodotus. So we have to differentiate between sources and the various sources in order to make sense. And then in the end to say if some practices existed or not. So to reply to your question, of course, I mean, but uh, of course I have to want, so I have to take into account uh, one of the most important example of triumphs, Charles V. And of course, yes, and there is this addition to the picture that Arabic Islamic culture, what is doing like, because also some of the stereotype on Sub-Saharan Africa also came from those sources. When, when uh, uh, Antonio Malfante went to Tuat, there were uh, Islamic traders and you see that the tension with, uh, with Sub-Saharan traders is there. There were wars, there were conflicts and that complicated even further the, the confusion. So yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. It was very, uh, very stimulating. And indeed, as uh, Jean was saying, it really connects to a discussion that we have been uh, having all day. Uh, and I wanted to invite you also to, to, to think with us. So, so we are really struggling with this final question that you have. So how can you differentiate between the classics as making an impact and really triggering, for example, uh, slavery from in, let's say, in practice that develops from other contexts and the classics just being used as a veneer to provide it authority or leg legitimizing things. So when, how could we really see the classics as an actor in shaping certain structures and practices? And to make things even a bit more confusing, another element that we have been discussing is that uh, um, it's not only the classics that inform the early modern period, but it's also the other way around. Uh, the early modern ideas, world of ideas, inform of what we think the classics are uh, at a very basic level, even in the interpretations of words. So in a very structured, very basic level, modern context inform the classics as well. So we get a very confusing system in which it becomes extremely difficult to disentangle the, imp the actual impact of the classical or, or the discourse. And just hoping that you can help us in this uh, thought process uh, a bit. Thank you. It's my fault and I, <laughs> I created this confusion. So it's correct that you addressed the question to me. So I want to start from the, your final consideration. Of course, it's the future with influencing the past. And it's always like that because of uh, how historiography is formed. But then uh, important topics of the present that then forge our way to look at the past. I can say at least we can have some certainty the majority of cases on the sources. So we have this class that uh, we are with, I mean, uh, Kadamosto is going with this pattern in West Africa and all scholars around the world are using contemporary uh, patterns to, to see the uh, old world. But at the same time, we have sources and we, we can ascertain whether a source is from our period or is from the past. So in some cases, my hope that is that we can see whether some information, for instance, uh, was already known or if some source is reliable in terms of contacts. But of course, when you have this, so uh, what I want to tell you is that when, when I work it on, on Antonio Malfante materials, because that's what, what I'm doing now with the other more serious projects, let's say that looking at the notarial archives, and uh, we have now a series, we uh, say we, because we are a group of scholars, we have now a series of informations about the family who traded with Antonio Malfante in the Tuat. And this information came from the archive of Genoa, notarial deeds. So we have information on goods, on, on uh, networks of Jewish traders there, kind of archeological sources, because those are fragments of notarial deeds. But we are trying to reconstruct in the context of the letter of uh, Antonio Malfant. And what we see, at least what I'm seeing now, is that you can really read the letter looking at his movement in the Sahara and toward the Sahel, and you can measure 
the let's say the unreliability, the, the fact that you see that some information are stereotypes as connected with the distance. So at least this can we do. We can uh, try to go back to the archives. I'm saying that because not all scholars then go to the back to the archives, but it depends. I mean, we can use as, as many approach we want, but if we come back to, to these archives and we systematically study all the sources there are, and that is possible. I know it's 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 a Sisyphus uh, work, but 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 it's possible. So that's what we did in the past years. We, we look at almost, I mean, 400,000 uh, piece of paper of this notarial archives from for 80 years. And so maybe some documents escaped, but uh, we can reconstruct the presence of these traders in the area there of the Tuat. And that can help us to, to measure the distance. And when we can measure like that, we can do in a kind of objective way, right? Because we can say that was these places, these goods. Then we can see how the information arrived, when and where. And, and I hope that with that, we can differentiate between information that were more connected with stereotype and less biased. At least we can refer to where the people were. When, for instance, several of these Arabic uh, Islamic sources uh, and many, of course, of these other uh, Renaissance sources were of people that never were there. So uh, Leo Africanus, for instance, also the, uh, all the account on North Africa, we can see that, it, I mean, it, obviously we don't have a proof, but if we measure these informations with those of the archives, maybe we can create, I don't know if I'm replying to that, like a a differentiation of this of these sources. That is what I want to do with the silent trade sources. Let's start again differentiating all the sources. Maybe there will be always troubles, as you were saying, but at least we can notice that Polanyi is like Rodrigo's. Why? That is that is not sound weird. Well, I don't know if I reply, but that's what we can do. Other questions or remarks here in the room, maybe at home? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, indeed, this uh, fits really perfectly to what we have been discussing today. It's really uh, great. Um, I had a question about, um, do you see different patterns or different structures in the production of knowledge between the Italian and the Iberian Peninsula? And um, how does that relate to different uh, political uh, yeah. milieus? Th thank you for this question. Yes, for instance, on triumphs, I couldn't find, but it's a relatively new topic for me. On triumphs, I couldn't find, find I mean, th there is obviously uh, Charles V, but it's, there is not this, also this prayer tradition that you can find Cassoni like you can find in Tuscany, for instance, that uh, tr triumphs end up also in, in late 15th century. And on, on sources <clears throat> related to, for instance, the silent trade, yes. Again, the Renaissance sources so far that we have on, on silent trade are those of Fran Mauro and Alvise da Cadamosto. So there were Italian uh, traders or, I mean, cartographer in the case of Fran Mauro. Um, other things that we can differentiate in that the presence of, uh, sub-Saharan enslaved people in the Italian peninsula, even if there are now many scholars, young scholars, or, so they are going to the archives so far, as I know, my impression is that there were not many, it depends from the city that you are in the place you see, but for instance, in Genoa, I can tell you that, uh, again, some documents can be, you know, we, we couldn't find because it's it's really sometimes very, confusing to study in the notarial archives. You have pieces of information, you don't have registers. You have this rope, this uh, uh, box, the not even boxes, piece of papers that are closed with a rope, and then you have to uh, sort through piece by piece. And, and in those uh, documents, we found the same amount of enslaved people from Sub-Saharan Africa than from Canary Islands. The so-called Guanche or Amazigh people, but uh, so just a few. Then if you look at probably in Sicily, there are more. In Naples, we don't know much. The notarial deeds are quite complex in Naples. 
and in Florence, just a few. But that doesn't mean that Italian traders didn't trade in the enslavement of, of sub-Saharan people, because in fact, like the famous Bartolomeo Marchioni from Florence or the Genoese I'm studying, there are several Genoese, they were based in the Iberian Peninsula. And from there, they traded in, in these people and they sold to other people in the Iberian Peninsula and in the New World. So to reply to your question, sometimes there are sources which I cannot tell you what they are from. I mean, I know where they were produced, but was an Italian that lived, I mean, someone from Florence lived for 30 years in Lisbon. Was that a Portuguese or an Italian? But what I can see is that certain people, group of enslaved people, and then goods, objects, didn't reach the Italian peninsula. They were played, they were sold in the plaque tournament of the Atlantic. So there are a lot of differences that we can draw to enrich the picture. Thank you. Questions or remarks here at home? If not, I, oh, yeah. Sorry to make the block. <laughs> um, yeah, I um, uh, wanted to go back maybe to what you were saying about um, the the images of the animals in uh, the manuscripts of uh, Pierre Candido de Chambrio's text. Um, I uh, was wondering whether you have looked at uh, like classical, uh, so I mean, uh, descriptions of animals by of these animals by uh, ancient authors because um, I was just randomly googling um, Pliny the Elder and his na natural history which, which might be uh, an obvious uh, author to think about in this context he uh, doesn't describe uh, well he, he does describe um, uh, monkeys but he his knowledge of it um, is uh, um, points to well, the, the probability that probably he hasn't seen uh, these images uh, these uh, these um, um, animals and that he uh, also, um, that uh, the Roman knowledge of it was uh, scarce. So uh, maybe you can make your point, even your argument that uh, this knowledge increased um, uh, in the Renaissance, um, even uh, even stronger by um, pointing to uh, yeah how uh, the lack of knowledge about these animals in antiquity, because of course all these authors uh, uh, were in Renaissance were were also looking first uh, to how how uh, Pliny the Elder and other authors have described it. So I was wondering, maybe you have looked at at other classical authors that has described them. Thank you, thank you very much. Of course, this is also, if I understood correctly what you are saying, that, that the fact that uh, in classic antiquity there was a certain knowledge or there wasn't sometimes. So I've mentioned that uh, there are sources uh, which says that in Cartago there were the skins of gorillas, but then the categorization of gorilla is very, very late than in Europe. And, and so there is this back and forth knowledge. So sometimes in the past there were more knowledge about uh, things, in this case animals, uh, and, and sometimes less. So again, I, what I'm saying is, what if we collect all the sources, and actually this is not something I can do, I can focus on the silent trade because I do economic history mostly, but uh, if what if we collect all the sources on the non-human primates, for instance, from classic antiquity, Arabic Islamic world, and I mean, in several parts of the globe, but if you want to do related to the African continent, and actually we will do probably a workshop on, on animals next year, and there will be also a primatologist who will come because there is the it's important to have the knowledge of uh, historian of science people that have studied that uh, as as formation uh, that, that have this background so of course my my approach would be let's take one topic at a times and i mean if we want to avoid the confusion and and try to differentiate among all the sources that we have and so as you have seen today the confusion is more intense at the end of my paper because the silent trade is something I know better. And again, there are new sources we can be found. And then on animals, uh, again, there is <laughs> there is a lot to do. And on on the enslavement and connection with uh, 
with the, the ancient tradition, there is a lot more. So I wanted also to give this idea that uh, I think for, to me is important to work one step at a time, but it can be done in a kind of systematic way. Let's look at all the sources together, differentiating them. Um, a, 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 a directly uh, following up question to that on the relationship between categorization and racism um, that you also uh, touched upon. Um, I was wondering, so I guess in general, uh, for a long time, the kind of consensus among historians of racism has been that racism originated in the 18th century with classification uh, attempts, like uh, also in the context of categorization of animals, right? So Linnaeus kind of thinking in terms of species, it was then, um, Used as well to classify human beings. Would you say that the 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 materials that you are studying complicate that story as well, in the sense that you might conclude that that there is earlier forms of racism that predate the kind of 18th century Enlightenment narrative of classification? Thank you. This is a huge question. I'm not. Yes, uh, I, I'm not pretend. To, I don't want to. You know, like I'm not an expert of that. Also conceptually, because I feel I'm weak conceptually to 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 work on, on this on this also if i look at the ignorance that i have on the historiography and uh, what i can say that i tend to have a lot of mistrust on categorization that say this phenomenon start from this period unless is something you can document with you know more or more physical kind of phenomenon so for instance in genoa we know that the price of the enslavement, uh, enslaved people, maybe went also with uh, with this kind of notion that we can define as racist, and this is a kind of knowledge that some archivist actually has in Genoa. Nobody has written that, but when I talk with people that have seen many more documents that uh, what we have seen, we have seen all as a group of four or five people we have seen this 400,000 and more notarial deeds but there are people that you know work in their cards since a lot of and and when i talk with these colleagues they say oh of course in Genoa you don't find you find only tatar and enslaved people you don't you don't find uh, people from uh, from sub saharan africa and i don't know because i i want to see whether it's possible to make this uh, this this affirmation but as connected when you look at the price of the people the, the reply to you will be yes but not because of my my studies i think that that the, this information have always been been there in archives in libraries is is how you categorize that so that's why i refrain to entering that because conceptually i'm i'm weaker and and i, I don't i don't feel i have i can provide you the information from the archives I don't know whether this called racist. Some colleagues call proto racist. I don't know why they have to use proto and not racist. So I don't know. I, I again, I, I would tend to rely on on these sources and see, for instance, I mean, look at what Isabella d'Este Gonzaga uh, did in Mantua. That creating, you know, that this is uh, the studies on could be done also on breeding on enslaved people in during the Renaissance, because what Isabella Gonzaga did with uh, people affected by dwarfism and, and sub-Saharan people, people was that. That was doing breeding. They forced it, they, uh, um, that there are evidences about that have been studied. Isn't that racist? But, but uh, you know, I, I feel more confident in providing you the sources. Then. Um, so, so it, for example, in the archives in Genoa, are are people enslaved from, say, the Black Sea region? Are they categorized differently than people from Sub-Saharan Africa? The price is different. Okay, yeah, but there's no mention of like physical characteristics, for example. There is no mention because there is no mention at all of physical characteristic of anyone in the document. Yeah, so yeah, okay, it's yeah. it's the only the the progenie that is the origin of yeah, the person, yeah. but not, and it's those notarial deeds are like a few sentences mm -hmm. and a lot of rituals of lines. So you cannot differentiate. So, but when you see there, it could be because there were not works to be done 
That's another hypothesis that implantation were used in enslaved people, so they were brought into the Atlantic. But according to other scholars, but this is the knowledge I apart from the archives, it could be correlated also to, to something you can call racism. Yeah, thanks. And I, I just wanted to connect it to your question. So because I think the most important source for monkeys or gorillas is uh, Hanno's uh, Periplus, uh, this, this voyage, uh, 7th century BC perhaps, and I think we only have the Greek version of the Hellenistic uh, period. Um, and, and I think this is an interesting uh, case because what is described in this source is not, uh, because you say classifying uh, non-humans, uh, the gorillas are described as a form of humans, that are throwing things from the trees and inviting people. But from the perspective of the, the writer, it's not uh, an animal that's being described. It's a particular form of human that they that they think they encounter. So this is my example of, so, so what, what happens is that we now retroject a gorilla or a chimpanzee into these descriptions. So you, you get this confusing interpretive circle uh, that while, while if you would critically read the sources itself, the description is not about a monkey. It's what we think they meant was uh, was a monkey, of course. So that illustrate the, the, the previous point I, I, I was trying, uh, trying to make. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I uh, work a little bit um, uh, at, on the bibliography on, on uh, Annos Periplus and, uh, and then uh, since Paul here uh, this charge is missed, uh, and as a useful sources, I, I decided to to pause on that because it's really really a complex uh, sources. Also, the story how was you know that it you know rediscovered. It was, it, it was available to the period, right? So in the sixteenth century. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do they refer to to it as a? No, I mean to to one of Periplus, not many of the sources have considered, but this is on non-human primates. It's I mean, I don't know even know if a new subject. And for me, it's just something I'm fascinated by. And that therefore we are also doing a workshop which also considered that with the help of people that are doing history of science. It's yeah, that that is also complicated because you don't know where they put the boundaries or yeah, between human and non-human. But I think it's a fascinating topic to work on. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I have a curiosity about the silent trade and the schema you showed uh, about how it uh, uh, works. Um, I was wondering uh, how you see the power uh, dynamics in uh, in that, uh, because like in the uh, culture of uh, uh, of gift uh, ex ex exchanges is uh, normally on a on the same level like uh, uh, different elites uh, exchanging uh, gifts but in the in the schema you you showed uh, the, there should be always uh, one of the two groups uh, making the, the final decision on uh, accepting the trade so uh how do you see this uh, power like uh is it uh, constant uh, with the uh, more powerful groups or does it uh, change thank you so much because it's i mean it's uh, you apply the logic on the on the on the on the story i tell you and that's uh, very helpful because i help to listen you know to work on confusion and Yes, so the, the hypothesis we are making is a parallel exchange of gifts, uh, at least my colleague, because I'm, I have to say I, I'm not sure it existed or not. But uh, I have to say that, yeah, what you have noticed, it's like when you play chess, right? I mean, when it depends on who start. But so the other part had also the possibility to live. So imagine you were bringing clothes and bringing gold. I see the amount of gold of sorry of clothes, and I don't don't put anything. So it, that is valid. Your question, if we assume, and maybe that's because of me, that that the exchange has to be done. But if we assume the possibility, also there is the free possibility not to play. Okay, so in this case, not to play. You put your clothes. I don't like. I don't put any gram of gold. Done. So that's that's parallel, right? It's not power. So, but in a, in a 
in a if yes we are in a box and we have to make an exchange of course you are right because if you put something then i have to put something so if you put you know something that is not valuable for me i'm forced to put a quantity in that case you are you would be right that's i don't know if i'm replying correctly but that's power dynamic but if i can leave the box no right that's part of it yeah exactly thanks <laughs> okay Um, my question is also about the silent trade, but it's about what if it is a myth? Uh, because one thing I didn't, that wasn't quite clear to me is um, if it is a myth, then how exactly did it function to help trade or promote trade? According to Paolo Moraes Farias, exactly, that he has yeah. said, okay, so then this is present in, an, in his article and the hope that was that he was going to publish a second article about that. So that, that article, it's more focused on the fact that it was a myth. So the second part hasn't come. And it helped in the sense that as a proxy, as a story, as a legend, like when uh, um, when when people like Alvise de Cadamosto went to West Africa and recounted stories, and at the end I said he had this classic paradigm in mind and he is using to, to see, to, to codify what is seen or what is not seen, what is telling to us. So in the same way, I guess, because as, that has not been written. And um, I mean, and Maraj Farias is an amazing scholar. So I mean, it's let's hope or, or someone of the fellow students can write that. But as I, I guess as a pattern, uh, like a kind of legend that can help people. Actually, the, my colleague Gerard Schwen has found a, a source, I didn't mention too much, of the 17th century in, uh, in French, which described the exchange of the silent trade with the use of uh, weights of small uh, objects that I've put on, on the, on, I mean, on, you see on the flyers of the, those are weights, African weights, and the source described these weights. So one possibility, one question would be, if there are these details which are typical of the certain African region, why should be fake? Why should be a legend or a myth? But that, again, I also take into account that the possibility that you have uh, like a myth with true details because it's full <laughs> our life of this, right? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. If there are no other questions in the room and at home, I think it is time to round off this part of uh, the research dialogue, but because of course we can continue. We don't have to keep silent afterwards and talk to you. Uh, I, for my part, have many different things to, to ask, but I will reserve them for, for the drinks. Uh, but not after thanking you again for this wonderful uh, lecture on these different knowledge traditions and also for the rich discussion that uh, developed. Uh, thank you people at home. Thank you people here. Uh, let's round off with an applause. And um, well, we will uh, welcome you here uh, at the CNIR and at home for uh, a, a further uh, CNIR research dialogue in December. And we hope to be able to let you know very soon who uh, the speaker of the December dialogue will be. But if you cannot miss us uh, for that long, there are several uh, events in the coming uh, weeks. I just mentioned a few, so uh, already this week, there is uh, a conference partly here, partly uh, at the Belgian Institute, Beyond the Alps, artistic e exchanges between the Low Countries and Italy in medieval and Renaissance sculpture, um, uh, already started today and in the coming days. Uh, then uh, he was already mentioned, Pliny the Elder. There's a conference on Pliny the Elder on uh, magic and religion that is partly supported also by our Institute uh, on Thursday and Friday uh, at the Bibliotheque 
Biblioteca Valiciliana and the uh, Danish Institute. And then further in November, there will, will be a lecture in the uh, in, on classical reception, the classics and the Dutch writer, Willem, Willem Frederik Hermans on the 22nd of November. Um, and uh, those are events you're uh, welcome to join us here and some of them are also online. Um, we are uh, gathering for the drinks here, uh, and uh, the people at home, maybe you can also uh, have a drink on us and see you soon. Thank you very much, and uh, see you soon. Thanks.